Uh, we'll now move to uh, questions from the press. I'll, um, I'll start with Lewis. ITV. The millions of people that voted for UKIP uh, were, um, I think, disappointed uh, by the election result um, in the sense that, you know, never in the history of British democracy have so many been represented by so few. Um, <laughs> but has that, uh, it's interesting, has that led to disillusionment amongst the four million? Uh, no. Actually, uh, what I'm detecting is some anger amongst those people, determination to vote UKIP again, and determination to make sure more of their friends and family vote UKIP again. I think what those people who voted for us, and let's not forget that the year before that, we won the European elections across the United Kingdom, uh, what the people who voted for UKIP, and indeed what the people who didn't vote for UKIP, but who agree with what UKIP is trying to do, and that is a very, very significant number of people, what they would expect us to do is to do what we've always done, and that is to go out there, tell the truth, and to take on the tough subjects that people in Westminster find too awkward or embarrassing um, at their, in, in their social lives in Notting Hill uh, <laughs> to go out and address and tackle. So what they'll expect from us is us to take on the tough issues and for us to be the ground campaign. And look, let's be honest, there are lots and lots of Eurosceptic groups within this country, but there's no Eurosceptic group in this country that has a branch network of over 300 branches in all four corners of the United Kingdom and equally has nearly 50,000 paid up members who are itching to start delivering leaflets through doors, putting posters on fences and organising these hundreds of public meetings that I'm talking about. And that is the role that we will play. Somebody will get the designation for the yes side and somebody will get the designation for the no side. And at some point in time, there, there will have to be a head-to-head -head debate, I guess, between the Prime Minister on the yes side and somebody from the no side. Whoever gets that designation for the no side, you know, they will choose who they think the best person is to represent our side of the argument. And you know what? I couldn't care less who it is. What I care about is that we win this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get back the independence of our country. <laughs> so, <laughs> fine, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Now, so here we are. Uh, Calais. A desperately serious situation. Uh, as somebody that travels regularly through that port, I have to tell you that I've felt intimidated going through there just recently. Uh, there are nine migrants that have been killed so far this year, and it is a worsening, a deteriorating situation. Um, I did describe a situation where my car was surrounded uh, by a lot of migrants, and I felt intimidated. Whether this morning I used the word swarm, or the Prime Minister used the word swarm, who led who on, I'm not particularly sure, nor am I really convinced it's that relevant. Okay. Um, Darren Sky. Well, thank you for that series of questions, and I hope everybody's got lots of time here today. Look, whilst the media obsess about who the key figure will be in the yes and no campaign, my concern today is that without us kicking this off, there isn't even a no campaign. Nothing is happening. So my priority is to see a no campaign, to see one of these two groups get designated, and let them work out who they want the head figure to be. And I don't care who it is. I care that we win. The Labour leadership contest. It's terrific, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm not sure this afternoon whether to watch that or the ashes. I mean, I really am, you know, terribly split over this. Um, I have to say, I don't particularly support Jeremy Corbyn's politics. Uh, 
but at least he stands for something. At least he has some ideas and some principles uh, that he's prepared to defend. Whether they're wacky or not is up to each individual to make their mind up. Um, I, I have to say, uh, it does seem to me uh, that to open up your membership to three pounds a go, um, anyone can join and influence the leadership contest um, is a mistake that even a relatively young party like UKIP would never, ever make. Uh, I would have thought, uh, given the unison announcement overnight, that he now does look like the favourite. He now does look like um, winning. What does that mean for UKIP? Um, I think it means that the success that we've had already uh, with very moderate, politically very moderate Labour voters in the Midlands, the North, in Wales, um, I think under Corbyn that will continue. Uh, what it means for the referendum is potentially more interesting. Uh, that, that actually, uh, as he takes the lead, he's trying to pretend that he really wants to reform the European Union. I suspect somewhere inside Jeremy Corbyn is a real democratic uh, socialist that wants to get out and realises, particularly after the way Greece has been treated, that the EU is a fundamentally anti-democratic place to be. So if Corbyn does win the leadership, I think the implications of that for the referendum might incentive for people to keep wanting uh, to come. I know people who work for the border agency in Dover. They say they are hopelessly under-resourced. Uh, and it seems to me there are two things we have to do. We have to make sure the border agency is resourced. We have to make sure we have the ability to check cars and check lorries and caravans that are coming into the United Kingdom. And if short term, that means we have to use people other than the border force, then fine. But longer term, we're going to need a beefed up border force. I would also say that I think in terms of, str of transport, strategically, we've got this wrong. We've placed all our eggs in the Dover Calais basket. So as soon as there's, you know, there's an industrial action in Calais, which happens pretty regularly, Operation Stack uh, comes into being. Operation Stack has become a fact of life in Kent over the last few years. And it strikes me that actually we should be thinking about using ports like Ramsgate and perhaps Folkestone and spreading some of the load. I'll do broadcast first and then come to print. Uh, Theo LBC. Uh, Mr Farage, do you foresee any circumstances in the future, longer term, where uh, the situation may become so serious that we'd have to close the Channel Tunnel either temporarily or permanently? Uh, well, it's always possible, isn't it? But, I, but, but, but let's say that I hope that it doesn't happen. I mean, look, it's important. You know, it's important. The Channel Tunnel is important. It's important for trade. It's important for leisure. Uh, here we are, uh, you know, with the summer holidays uh, just having kicked off. So let us hope those circumstances don't occur. But if the French authorities don't start to take a much stronger and tougher line, it is a very real possibility. You see, what's happened is... All of the emphasis was on the ferry port. If you go back six months, it was the ferry port where the migrants were camped. It's the ferry port where people were attempting to get into lorries and cars and caravans and all the rest of it. Since the massive fencing has gone up around the ferry port, the actions all moved to Eurotunnel. And the weakness of Eurotunnel is however much you build up the security or the fences at the Eurotunnel terminal at Coquel itself, you know, you're subject to the SNCF National French Rail Railway line where you go a couple of kilometres down the line um, and find fencing that is frankly pretty easy uh, to clamber under. So uh, I am surprised uh, that the French haven't done more than they've done. Uh, we hear an announcement overnight that another 120 police um, are being put there. But, you know, against a couple of thousand people um, swarming a tunnel, frankly, there isn't very much more they can do. So I would say the risk to the Channel Tunnel being closed doesn't come from here doesn't come from Dover, but it does come from France and the French authorities, and I very much hope it does not happen. Uh, Phil, Meridian? Yeah, Phil Hornby from Meridian. Back to the referendum, Nigel. You say only one referendum 
and no would mean no. Does that follow that yes would mean yes, and that would be the end of the argument? Well, I think yes does mean yes, and I think, as I try to lay out in my talk, uh, that if we do vote yes, we have voted for deeper integration. I mean, frankly, it will be no holds barred um, as far as the Euro fanatics in this country are concerned. Um, uh, would I accept a yes vote, I think really was your question. Uh, well, I'd have to accept a yes vote, um, but I'm never going to wake up the next morning thinking uh, that it's right that a bunch of unelected old men in Brussels make the law of this country. Um, I, I, it, it'll be very difficult to reconcile me with that in the, re in the event of a yes vote, but politically it may well kill off the argument uh, for some considerable period of time. And as I said earlier, this is a once in a, this is a, once in a generation political opportunity. And that is why we need people in politics, in public life, in the media, entertainment, sport, you name it. We need people who, when they talk to, we, when they talk to their friends, say they think the EU is bad for Britain, we need them to come out and start saying it publicly. Mesa? Uh, Express. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Mesa Hall from the Daily Express. Um, Nigel, um, what lessons, if any, are you taking from the Scottish independence referendum campaign where you had a campaign against the status quo which lost but still seemed to have been energised by the experience? Are you seeing this, I mean, as you said, as, as a once-in-a-generation thing or even if you lose, could it energise <coughs> the Eurosceptic movement to eventually win, win what you want? Well, you're right. I mean, you know, one of the things this opinion poll that, as I say, is being, is being released conducted by a European political party and is being released right now. One of the findings of this poll is if the referendum was for us to join the European Union, we would say no. Because why would we join a club that costs so much money, that opens up our borders, uh, that regulates our businesses and stops us having our own global trade deals? So the one advantage that Cameron has got is he has the status quo on his side and he will use this argument of the fear of the unknown. However, if you look back to the 19th, and I'm going to go back further than the Scottish referendum, if I may, for a quick moment. If you go back to the 1975 referendum, you know, what you see is a no campaign appealing to traditional British values, talking about our relationship with the world, the Commonwealth, etc. Um, and nothing wrong with any of that. But what you saw from the yes side all those years ago was they owned the progressive argument. Even though these links and associations and two world wars were desperately important things, here was our chance to join this trendy, modern, fantastic club that had great economic growth, that didn't have the inflation or the three-day week or all of the terrible problems that bedeviled the country that was then called, if you remember, the sick, you're, you're too young, but the sick man of Europe. All right? So, so they had the progressive argument. Uh, and I think in this referendum campaign, we've got the chance now of owning the progressive argument because their defence of the European Union, frankly, is if you weren't in it, they'd be beastly to you. Well, if that's the case, they don't sound like very nice people. I wonder why we're doing this anyway. Um, their, argument, uh, their argument that if we weren't part of it, all trade would cease, I think people have seen through that already. I was very struck when Nick Clegg used those debates against me in, 20, in 2014, how little resonance that had with the public because they understand these things. And I think, so we've got the argument that actually the progressive argument is we want democracy. The progressive argument is we want government accountable to ourselves. The progressive argument is we're living in a global economy and we want to be free to make our own friendships and our own associations. The one thing I thought Alex Salmon got brilliantly right is he managed to engender um, a sense of optimism. He managed to get uh, a feeling of perhaps, um, I mean, the economics were pretty rusty, but of, of what Scottish identity was all about. And he did go up and down the country holding public meetings, walking down streets doing selfies and meeting people. And he did actually give Scottish people the opportunity to meet him, his colleagues, and get, and, and, and get engaged. So to some extent, yes, there was much of... Forgetting the, forgetting the policy, there was much of that campaign that Salmon got right, and we can learn from that. Yes. Owen Bennett, Puffington Post. Um, just wanted to clarify, Nigel, are you saying that you would definitely not be, you're not going to put yourself forward as the leader of the No campaign? Are you saying that you, you personally are not going to do it? And secondly, when you talk about groups which need to kick up the backside, do you include the Exploratory Committee for the EU Referendum, which of course has UKIP MP Douglas Carswell on it. <coughs> what I'm saying is this. I'm saying 
that, 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 that I'm making it clear today that we are going to take the lead in the ground campaign in this country. We will do so from September on a scale that this party has never attempted before. And, and, and you know, when I say to you, we're going to be doing hundreds of public meetings up and down the country, I'm not exaggerating, and in a couple of weeks' time, we will take out some national press adverts and show you where those venues are and who's engaged with them. So that, let, let, let's be clear, that is what I'm saying we'll do, and we are by far the best equipped party to do it. I'm also urging those in, in other campaigns who seem to think it's better to wait until the Prime Minister comes back from his renegotiation, I'm urging them that that is a terrible mistake, that we're giving the Prime Minister a big head start in this, and that that is the wrong approach. So whether these are exploratory committees or not, what I'm saying is the whole Eurosceptic movement needs to do two things. One, get cracking, and two, come together. And I am, I, I am saying, if any, if any of those groups want to come and share our platforms over the next few months, they are very, very welcome. Ben, Daily Telegraph. Oh, where is he? He's, he's there. So, that's down there. Hi, thank you. Um, Nigel, can I ask a bit more about those um, Tory Eurosceptics who you're frustrated are sitting on their hands? Um, firstly, are you, have you had any conversations with cabinet ministers uh, who will campaign to leave the EU? And would you urge them to, to speak out? And secondly, do you think there might be a backlash if Eurosceptic Tories don't speak out and then there is a narrow yes vote? Uh, right. Um, the, <coughs> look, you know, Harold Wilson decided uh, that cabinet ministers would be allowed to choose which, which side of the campaign they went on. It is pretty clear that David Cameron is not pursuing that policy, uh, that everybody will be bound by collective responsibility, whether they're members of the cabinet, junior ministers, uh, you know, parliamentary private secretaries, or whatever they are. So already within the Conservative Party, you've narrowed down the potential number of rebels uh, because very few people uh, give up ministerial positions on a point of principle. Would I urge those that agree with our side of the argument to do so? Yes, of course I would. I'd be delighted to see it. Uh, but in an age when politics is a, a career for most people, above everything else, uh, you know, I, I wait to be surprised. Okay? Uh, and I suspect that amongst the new intake of Conservative MPs, there'll be many uh, looking at the plight of the Labour Party, thinking, I'm on a pretty good number here. You know, I could be here for the next three or four general elections and, you know, my salary is 66,000 a year, but if I become a minister, it's 115,000 pounds a year. Uh, maybe best I toe the line just on this one particular account. So, you know, I mean, look, I wait to be surprised. Uh, I wait to be surprised. Uh, but I think if uh, we were to put our faith um, in the Westminster village uh, to stand up and fight on a fundamental point of democratic principle on behalf of the people of this country, all I would say to that is don't hold your breath. Um, and as far as the political question, uh, what would happen if there was a narrow yes uh, and Cameron was seen to have outspent the no side and, and we were seen to have been done down, you know, your real question, would that mean a massive surge to UKIP? Um, I don't know. But you know what? That's not what I care about. What I care about is winning this referendum and getting back our independence. Um, Sam Coates from The Times. Um, Mr Farage, would you truly welcome the addition of Boris Johnson to playing a high-profile role in the No campaign, or does just a little bit of you worry that um, he's Eurosceptic light, or it would be all about his own ambitions, or it would just distract the No campaign and turn it into the Boris versus George show? Um, look, the, the, I, I, just, I just don't know what Boris Johnson's going to do. Um, as far as I know, Boris Johnson believes in amnesties for illegal immigrants, and as far as I know, when Boris was on a tour of India with Cameron 18 months ago, he said that EU membership was vital for global trade. Um, if there is a Damascene conversion from Mr. Johnson, uh, will he steal lots of the limelight? Yes. But, but you know something? A lot of those in Westminster who see themselves or hope when the moment comes will be big voices in the No campaign are the kind of people whose public recognition is so pitifully low they wouldn't be an asset to the No campaign. And the one thing about Boris, if he has this Damascene conversion, uh, is that, do you know what? The public know who he is. So I would say, come on, Boris. You know, see the light. Come on in. The water's lovely. <laughs> uh, 
I think Boris Johnson wants this uh, double referendum. I know, I know. Fine, yeah. He's got a lot to learn, of that yeah. was no doubt. But, but, you know. Anybody who knows their Mind history. you, he does want to be leader of the Tory party, so you never know, do you? Well, anyone who knows their history of the Conservative <laughs> Party know that when it comes to double referendums, it doesn't really go very well. No. Um, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Joe Mays from Bloomberg. Um, on the radio this morning, Nigel, you said the No campaign needs a leader who can debate best against David Cameron on TV, live, in front of the British public. After your successes against Nick, Nick Clegg, can you name someone who you think would be better than yourself in those debates? Oh, I'm sure there's a very long list indeed. And look, you know, you're all obsessing about who's going to lead the No campaign. Unless we get this thing kicked off in September, there won't be a No campaign, and we'll lose it by a huge margin. So, look, it will be up to whoever gets the designation for the No campaign to pick the person who'll, who'll do that debate against David Cameron. And you know what? It may even be somebody who's never been in politics before. It may be somebody, going back to the last question, who the British public actually know. Because I think politicians overestimate you know, their carry and their spread amongst the British population. They're not well known, they're not very well liked, so let's wait and see. And let's hope somebody emerges you, you know, from, from perhaps business or sport. Who's to say? Uh, yes, John, if you can... Thanks very much. I'm um, surprised you've got the uh, Welsh Assembly elections in May as well, and uh, lots of speculation that uh, this will be an election where you break through. Um, can you fight two campaigns at once? Also, what do you say to the arguments that it wouldn't be right to take Wales or Scotland if they vote yes out on the back of English votes? Well, I think um, point number one, you know, is UKIP capable of fighting a referendum and the Welsh Assembly election at the same time? Yes. And we'll be doing that also in Scotland, and we'll be doing it for the London Assembly, and we'll be doing it in Northern Ireland as well. Uh, you know, UKIP is a genuinely United Kingdom uh, independence party. You know, we've got representation in all four corners. So the answer to that is yes. Uh, and, you know, if the referendum was to take place in April or to take place in June, um, it is likely that, 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 in fact, those issues and those questions may well actually dominate the Welsh Assembly campaign. So, so, so I'm not nervous or frightened of that uh, in any way at all. Uh, last question. I've done 11. It's not bad, is it? Hi, Nigel. Kate McCann at The Sun. Um, you've said that you're not going to make a bid to lead the campaign, but you've also said that UKIP is going to play a really uh, important role in the ground campaign, and you've talked about how much of a swing that had in Scotland. Um, there are members of your own party and there's, uh, there are donors in UKIP that have concerns about you taking a lead role because you are a divisive figure. Would you be prepared to take a step back if you thought that might threaten the outcome of the no vote in the referendum? Uh, well, obviously, but uh, the answer is, the, uh, the, the real answer to your question is, in saying that I've said we'll take the lead in the ground campaign, can you tell me who else is there? Who else is there? Is there anybody else? Is there anybody? in Westminster that's about to go and launch on a tour of the country to try and wake people up, tell them the truth and persuade them to vote no. I would say whatever my shortcomings are, and they may be many, I think I'm probably better than no one uh, going out uh, to do this. And <laughs> and, 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 and can I also make the point that of the 12 or 13 people who, over the last four or five years, would be deemed to be major donors to UKIP. I have the support of every single one of them, but one. But one. There is one of those donors who doesn't think I should be involved in the campaign, but every, every, every one of the other donors is absolutely rock solid uh, behind me. Uh, and whilst one or two comments might have been made in the wake of the general election, uh, I would say this to you. I don't think there's been any point in the last decade when my leadership of the party or the party itself has ever been more united and more determined to do this job. Okay, thank you very much everyone for coming.